Okay, so this video corresponds to activity one, creating natural groupings uh, for lab 18, which we are looking at different animal phylum. So what you wanna start off doing um, first off is kind of just read through, hopefully you've read through the introduction already. I would just read through activity one and make sure you understand kind of what's happening at each step. We're gonna take a look at least for the couple, the first couple, we're gonna kind of read through some of these together. But I would just read through activity one first just to familiarize yourself with what's about to happen. And then you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna to wanna to print um, the animal images. And if you don't have a printer, that's okay. You can just look at them online. But I find that printing them, and I printed them um, six slides per page, then you have pictures of all these animals, okay? If we were in the lab, what would have happened is I would have given you um, I would have given you these animals. And so, you know, for example, the grasshopper would have been inside of a jar with preservative in it with a nice lid on it so you didn't have to smell or touch that preservative, but you would have been able to see through that jar and you would have been able to pick it up and kind of look at it from all angles. Um, so having at least, you know, a printout or a picture of the animal is okay. Um, you may have to dig a little bit farther and maybe do a little bit more research on the animal. If you're not sure, for example, if the grasshopper is you know, bilateral or radially symmetrical. Hopefully you know by now that that's, this is gonna be bilateral. It has a head and a tail region, and it definitely has a left and right side, as well as a dorsal and ventral surface. And so the grasshopper is definitely gonna be bilateral. Okay, but if you didn't know that, you, know, you may have to do a little bit of research and, and look some of these up. Okay, so what are we doing in activity one? We're gonna create a classification scheme. And for those of you who took General Biology 1 with us here at MVCC, this, we did this same activity, um, but with critters way back in Lab 1 of General Biology 1. Okay, so you've actually already made a classification scheme. For those of you who did not take General Biology 1 with us, I'm going to kind of give you the, the lowdown. Okay, you could also refer back to Lab 1 within your lab book, and there's an example um, of how to make a classification classification scheme as well as dichotomous key right in there okay so if you need if you need to see it you know all the way through um, you can go ahead and refer to that so this is what we're going to do to start off okay I've got a sheet of blank paper okay and at the very top of my blank paper and you could do this electronically or by hand I just prefer to do it by hand since I'm going to be working with my cards reading from the lab book I'm just going to do it by hand what I'm going to put at the top of my sheet of paper is I'm gonna put all animals, and we have 21 of them, okay, just so that you know. And I'm gonna make sure that I do this in an organized fashion, so I'm gonna put all animals, and there's too many of them to list them in this box up here. You're gonna see we will start listing as we move through. You're gonna put all animals at the very top and box it in. And now, to do this classification scheme, what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to read the lab book, and you're gonna be breaking up each group, you're gonna branch each group dichotomously, which means you're gonna branch into two parts. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm gonna take where it says all animals and I'm gonna draw two lines extending from that. Okay, and then what am I gonna what am I gonna put after those lines? Well, I need to read my lab book. So I'm gonna come over here, I've got activity one. Okay, I can kind of skip the directions here. Let me start at A. This is my first step. It says, separate the organisms into two smaller categories. One category will produce numerous external pores on their surface, which will give the creature a spongy appearance. The porous creatures may or may not be symmetrical. There will only be two organisms in this category, and we will not separate that any farther. Okay, so going back to my sheet of paper, my classification scheme, and I know what I'm gonna put now. I'm going to put spongy or porous, not spongy or porous. Okay, so I'm dividing up all of the animals, all of my little cards here, into two groups. One group is spongy or porous in appearance, the other is not, okay? So here we go, spongy slash porous. And my other group is going to be not spongy slash not porous. Okay, so I've got my two groups. I don't want to box them in yet because I need to put 
at least on the spongy side, the lab book says that there are two organisms that are going to be spongy. Okay, so let's look. We're going to break these up. So grasshopper, not spongy. So he's going to go in one pile. I'll put it over to my right. Not spongy. Nearus. Okay, you may have to look at the picture on there. Um, this guy has a lot of legs. Okay, um, he's definitely bilateral. Um, he doesn't look spongy. He doesn't look porous. He's got a solid body. Okay, so he's going to go with the grasshopper. Spiders. You guys know what spiders look like. They are not porous, right? Okay. Fasciola. Okay, you may need to look at the picture on, on your computer. You may need to do a little bit of research about this guy. This is a flatworm. He's got a solid body. He's flat. Uh, he's solid in cross-section. He is definitely not porous or spongy. Metridium. Metridium is a sea anemone. So he, he might look a little spongy. Let's put him off to the side for a second. Scypha. Okay, if you look at the picture online, you can see that these are very uh, porous looking. They look like they're all dotted with little tiny pores. So Scypha is definitely going to be spongy and porous. Okay, and again, if we were in the lab, you could you could really see this. And then I've got my crayfish. He's not spongy. I've got Lumbricus, which is the earthworm. He's not spongy. I've got Scolopendra, which again is another... Um, um, solid bodied, not porous, not spongy. I've got Aurelia, which is my jellyfish. These guys are not spongy or porous. Radially symmetrical, yes, uh, but not spongy and porous. A leech, not spongy, not porous. Sea urchin, spiny. Let's put them off to the side. We'll make a decision about that one. Tick. Tick's not spongy, not porous. The roundworm, mascaris, not spongy, not porous. Hydra, again, you may have to research this a little bit. He's not spongy, he's not porous. Planaria is another flatworm, sometimes parasitic, sometimes free living. He's not spongy or porous. Tinea, our tapeworm, again, not spongy, not porous. Amphioxus is going to be our only chordate in the bunch. This is the only uh, vertebrate. He um, is not spongy, not porous. Helix is a snail, not spongy, not porous. Then we've got Obelia, not spongy, not porous. And then we've got a sponge, definitely spongy, definitely porous. Okay, so the lab book tells you that there's only two, so that's going to help you here. Sponge and Scypha are our two. If we go back and we look at Metridium and Sea Urchin, I told you that these may appear a little bit spongy, uh, but they're not. Okay, uh, both are radially symmetrical. This one's definitely spiny, uh, but they're not spongy. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put those over there. So there, we just created two groups, the spongy porous and the not spongy, not porous. So let me put the names here. Under spongy porous, I'm going to list two of them. So we've got, you may wanna use a different color marker or pen. What happened to my pen cup? Oh, here it is. My children sometimes steal things on me. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to use, oh, I'm going to use pen and then I'll use a highlighter. Make this nice and fancy. So for my spongy slash porous group, I've got the sponge and I've got Scypha. Okay, and again, I'm going to box that in. And the lab book tells you that that grouping is not going to be broken down any farther. So we're actually done with that side. Okay, so when you get to a final box, you can highlight it, okay? Um, so I can take sponge and Scypha, and I'm done with these. I don't, I don't wanna put them back in my pile, right? I'm going to, you can, I don't know, toss them in the garbage or put them to the side. Okay, you are finished with those. Now everybody else, so if there were 21 organisms and I got rid of two, I got 19 left in my pile. I got, I got work to do, okay? I've only gone through part A. So I'm going to box off my other box. Now I didn't write everybody in it because again, I can't write 19 names in there. It'd be too much, okay? Now I'm done with this box. I'm now going to branch this one. So I've got to go back to my lab book and I'm going to read the next section. So I did everything in A. 
I'm going to go down to B now. It says, place the larger subgroup of animals left from the above separation into two groups. So I'm going to branch this again twice. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take that box and I'm going to branch it. Okay, so I took the non-spongy, non-porous, and I drew two lines from that box because I'm going to dichotomously break that box down into two groups. Okay, we're going to do this based on symmetry. So again, I'm going to look at my specimens. Um, it says some of them you may need to use a dissecting scope. I, I gave you images that were um, microscopic images, so kind of blown up for you. Uh, but again, if you need to do further research to figure out which one is uh, which, is it bilateral or radial, you can go ahead and you do that. I'm going to help you actually with this one. I'm going to do the first couple of layers with you. Okay, so it says place all of the animals with radial symmetry together in one group and those that are bilaterally symmetrical into a second group. Okay, and then it says when you look at Obelia, it's a colony. Each individual organism looks like a bud on a branch. So when deciding upon symmetry, look at just one bud. Okay, that helps us. So let's go back to our sheet of paper. We are going to branch this off into radially symmetrical and hopefully you read through the introduction you're doing um, some lecture work this week um, and so these terms hopefully are pretty familiar to you so I got radial symmetry and then I've got bilateral symmetry Okay, all right. So it doesn't tell me how many, huh? All right, that's okay. So let's go back to our group. Matridium. This guy looks like a sea anemone. Okay. Um, so he doesn't have a head or a tail region. I definitely wouldn't say he's got a left and right side. His top and bottom surface look different, right? He's got the his probably his oral um, surface there on the top, surrounded by tentacles. Okay, but um, definitely not bilateral. So I'm going to put him in radially symmetrical. That's matridium. The sea urchin, same thing. No head or tail, not, um, no left and right side. Okay, so definitely going to be radial. Obelia. Okay, this, the lab book says when you look at Obelia, look at one bud. Okay, one bud on this guy looks a lot like matridium. There's no head and tail region, right? no left and right side. These guys are definitely going to be radial as well. So so far I've got Obelia, I've got the sea urchin, and I've got Matridium. Okay, Helix, the snail. The snail has a head, right, with a concentration of sensory organs. He also has a tail region. Um, if I cut him sagittally, I would be left with a right and left side that are mirror images. Definitely has a dorsal and ventral surface. This guy is bilateral. Okay, one of my bilateral pile. Amphioxus, he's hard to see. Um, this guy actually um, is, a, is a chordate, okay? Definitely has a head and tail region. Um, has a lot of uh, pretty advanced structures. So he's gonna go over here with bilaterals. Tinea, the tapeworm. Tapeworms have a head and tail at the head region it's pretty neat. Tapeworms have, um, their head is called the scolex, and that's where we're going to find a concentration of hooks and suff suckers. That's how these guys attach themselves, um, you know, for to your intestinal tract, um, and they get bathed and all that nutrients. They don't have a digestive system or anything like that because digestion occurs outside the body, and they just take in all of that um, nutrient soup um, through their body wall. So kind of interesting. In any event, these guys are bilateral. Okay, planaria. He's a flatworm. He's pretty neat. When you take a look at the picture, I don't know if you can see it on here, but on your screen, um, you'll notice that this guy's got uh, sensory uh, organs, eye spots. Okay. Um, again, pretty advanced, definitely has a head and tail region. So he's going to be bilateral. Hydra. Hydra does not have a head and tail. Instead, it 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 um it has you know a a, a mouth region surrounded by tentacles, uh, which is pretty characteristic of radially symmetrical organisms. So I'm going to put him over here. Ascaris, our roundworm, bilateral. Tick. 
definitely bilateral. Okay, has a head region, definitely has a right and left side. Leech, same thing, has a distinct head versus tail region and definitely has a right and left side. Aurelia, our jellyfish, hmm, we're going to trend here, right? We've got a, an underside. This is the medusal stage. Right? And if you look at the, the underside there, that's where the, the mouth would be. And look, it's surrounded. You know, we've, we've got tentacles there as well. Okay, this guy is definitely going to be radially symmetrical. Does not have a head or tail region. Okay, instead has an oral uh, surface and then um, an upper surface. Okay, oral surface is on the bottom here. So yes, definitely radially symmetrical. Scolopendra has a head and tail that are distinct. Cut them down sagittally, definitely has a right and left side. Definitely bilateral. So is the earthworm, which scientifically is called Lumbricus, right? That's its genus name. Okay, bilateral. Crayfish, bilateral. Fasciola, the flatworm, bilateral. Spider, bilateral. Lyris has a head and tail. If you cut him down the middle, definitely left and right side. He's bilateral. And last but not least, the grasshopper, bilateral. We did it. So we just took all of those remaining 19 animals and we split them based on symmetry. We have the radially symmetrical animals on this side. We have the bilateral animals on this side, okay? So now we should do some listing. So for the radially symmetrical, I'm going to go ahead on my sheet here and I'm going to list the radially symmetrical. So I have Aurelia, I have Hydra, I have Obelia, I have the sea urchin. Some of these have their common names and some of them have their genus names. Eventually we'll have to probably make those all the same. But it's fine for us right now. And Metridium. Okay, so for my radially symmetrical animals, I have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Aurelia, Hydra, Obelia, the sea urchin, and Metridium. Everybody else, and I don't think I'll list on that side, everybody else is bilateral. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to box in. As we start to wean down here, we'll start to list. Okay, so that's what my thing looks like so far. Okay, you may need to use multiple sheets. Okay, so let me put my bilaterals over here for just a second. Let me go back to my lab book. Okay, so I did A and I did B. Let's look at C, see what it tells us now. It says to take the radially symmetrical animals and you are going to split them up or separate them based on the presence or absence of spines. Okay, before we do that, let's read the whole, that whole section. It says, recall that spines are inflexible along their entire length. The animals that lack spines will have tentacles in their place. The two subgroups produced by this separation represent two distinct phyla and will not be separated any farther. Okay, so that means I have to take my radially symmetrical animals over here and I'm going to split them. And this is the last time I'm, I'll be done with these animals at the end of this. I'm going to split them based on the presence of spines. So I'm going to put spines and then I'm going to put no spines. And so who has spines? Metridium has tentacles. Obelia has tentacles. Hydra has tentacles. Aurelia has tentacles. Sea urchin. Absolutely. This guy, as well as all of these, are radially symmetrical, but this is the only one that has spines. Okay, so underneath spines, I'm going to write sea urchin. And under no spines, I'm going to put everyone else. So Aurelia, Hydra, Obelia, and Metridium. Okay, and I'm going to highlight those because those are the end of my boxes. I know that because the lab book told me. And I can go ahead and I can put these, one, two, three, four, five, over with my sponge and scypha. 
that I already finished with. Okay. Now, you don't need them anymore, but I don't know. In the end, you might want to go through and make sure you have everybody accounted for it. You should have 21 animals in total. So now, um, I think I'll stop doing this with you. I want to show you my sheet so far. So again, at the top, I had all animals, and then I broke them up into spongy, not spongy. Uh, in the spongy category, I have my two listed, sponge and skypha, and I'm done with this box. I'm not over here. So again, I split those into bilateral and radial. And then my radial, well, my radial, camera's the opposite of my paper. My radial, I split into spines, no spines. And again, I highlighted in pink uh, the organisms that belong there. I'm done on this side, but I'm not done over here. So I'm going to go back to my lab book. And I'm going to stop kind of doing this with you, but I'm going to let you do it. You're going to return to your lab book on page 159 at the top. You're going to go to D, right? We finished C. And D says you're going to take the bilaterally symmetrical organisms and you're going to separate them into two groups based on the presence or absence of segmentation. Now it says to be careful. Tinea, also called the tapeworm, looks like it's segmented, but it's actually not. Okay. Um, you may have to do a little bit of research here. All right. Talks about segmentation a little bit. Okay, so again, you have your bilaterally symmetrical and you're going to break them up into uh, the presence or absence um, of segmentation. That's in D. Okay, so you're going to do segmented, not segmented. Okay. That's my next group over here. So the bilateral will get broken up into segmented, not segmented. Be careful, tinea is not segmented even though it looks like it is. You probably have to research um, a little bit about the others. Maybe go back to your phylogenetic tree and look at segmentation, kind of where it appeared, which groups will have it that will help you, okay? Um, and then after that, you're going to take the non-segmented um, animals and you're going to break them up if you look at E. You'll break them up into having a shell and not having a shell. And then if you go a little bit far E, you it says that the shelled organism you're done with, but the organisms that do not have a shell, there should be four of them, and they represent two distinct phylum, which are going to be different in their cross-section. So it says one of these specimens is round and the other is flat. We get, get, gotta be careful of the wording here. So in E, we take the non-segmented, again, we break them up into shell, no shell. The no shell you'll be done with, but the organisms with a shell have to be broken up into flat versus round. Okay, so make sure that you're reading the whole paragraph. Okay, and it tells you that only one specimen is round, the other three are flat. So you have one organism that has a shell, you have one organism that is round, and you have three that are flat there. Okay, so you can kind of know if you did it right based on the numbers. And then in E it says return to the bilaterally symmetrical organism, and you're going to split those up into having an exoskeleton and not having an exoskeleton. So I'm put, oh, I screwed that up. No exo. And then if we read a little bit further, you're going to take those organisms that lack the exoskeleton. You're going to, oh, you're going to break them up. I'm going to go down here with this. You're going to break them up into having a notochord and not. Okay, it may take you a couple rounds to do this. <laughs> it gets a little messy. Okay, so something like this. And again, I only did a little bit of the first couple with you. You gotta kind of figure out the rest on your own. But in the end, this is what it should look like. So in the end, if we look at the terminal boxes where we end up on, end up at, at the, at the end of all these branches, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine terminal end groups, and that's exactly what we want. 
Okay, so this, this is what you're turning in for activity one. You're going to take those 21 animals, you're going to read the lab book, you're going to break them up um, based on uh, the, how the lab book describes, and you're going to create this thing, which is called a classification scheme. Again, you might need a, bit of, a bigger piece of paper or take a couple sheets and just kind of tape them together there. Um, and then you're going to upload that to Blackboard, or you can do it electronically if you'd like to. That's fine, too. Now, for activity two, what you're going to be doing is you're going to try to decide which organisms, reading activity two, you're going to try to decide which of these end boxes represent the phylum described in activity two. Okay, so you kind of want to read through those. It describes each, each of the phylum, and you have to figure out, okay, which one of these end boxes, which organisms here uh, belong to that particular phylum. Okay, and then I'm going to make a second video for activity three where I'll walk you through how to make a dichotomous key. Okay, so good luck with activity one.